what I wanted to do was just a, just a quick recap of where we were last time. And last time I had given you a question from a previous test where we were looking at a cyclone. And we can use this actually as just as a recap. So uh, let's, let's perhaps use the case of uh, dust separation, dust from air. And we've got this mixture of dust and air coming in. And the idea is to separate the two. So where would you expect the, um, which of the two outlet streams would you expect to be primarily dust? Where would most of the, the weight or mass of the dust report to? Okay, let's use the correct names. What's the name of the stream out here? Underflow, okay. We'll sometimes see the term coarse stream. Okay. But uh, please don't refer to them as top and bottom because this unit can operate in any orientation and so it's not um, fair to call that one way or the other. The overflow stream is over here and sometimes that's called the fines. So this, we showed last time what um, an expected distribution of inlets and outlets would be. I actually don't like this figure up here because there's the implication that the distribution shape um, looks fairly similar between the feed, the fines and the course and that's not necessarily true. The reason why this plot looks like this is because the x-axis in each of these figures is a different scale. Okay, so that's really not a good representation. A better representation was one I had um, actually put up on the board last time. Let's perhaps just take a look at that quick so we can understand really what we're referring to today. If my feed coming in has a distribution that's sort of fairly normally distributed on the horizontal axis here, I'm plotting particle size in microns, so average diameter um, in microns, and my vertical axis is a mass flow rate, kilograms per hour. So blue is my feed. What we'll find then is my underflow distribution would lie somewhere over here, and my overflow, sorry, I, I should rephrase that, my underflow the, the more coarse, the heavier particles would actually be what's now in yellow. Okay, so this would be my coarse stream. So these are the larger particle size. And in orange here would be my fines. And blue is my, my feed. Okay, so yes, the distributions, if you looked at them, they look kind of uniform, uh, sorry, I should say normally distributed each time, and that's what you see here, these three distributions look similar, but the x-axes here are unlabeled and they've actually shifted. So this is a better way of looking at it, is superimposing the distributions, and it gives you an idea of which particles report to which stream. Now, th I want, where I'm going with this in today's class is, imagine a case where you really want to separate everything. So all the dust should be separated, so you've got a separation factor that's close to 100%. Okay, so ideally you would like your cyclone to take all your dust and to bring that solids to the underflow stream primarily so that your overflow contains no solids. And we'll see that that's pretty much impossible with a single cyclone, but there's ways that we can combine cyclones, so uh, create a sequence of cyclones. Um, to, to get that overall goal achieved. Okay, so we're going to um, see that a bit later on. Uh, last class then also, we actually put some numbers on this example. So let's just quickly do that again. I'm going to use those numbers to then introduce a new concept afterwards. So in the prior class, the example had the case where this feed was 88 kilograms per hour, the fines we were told was 27 kilograms per hour. And so then from a mass balance, the coarse stream 
is the leftover 61 kilograms per hour. So we see most of our solids there. These are the solids flows. It's not the dust plus air mixture. This is only the solids mass, 88 kilos in the feed, 27 and 61 in the overflow and underflow. So if we take those two numbers, now we can introduce a little bit of new theory here um, on the next slide. So slide 14 is new. The total efficiency of the cyclone is defined as the ratio of the mass in the coarse stream, so MC, which in this case is 61 kilograms, divided by the total mass fed to the cyclone. So in this case, that's 88. So for this particular example, that cyclone would have an efficiency of 69.3. Again, indicating higher is better if you're looking at separating all your solids from your fluid stream. If you did that, all your solids would report to your core stream, so your numerator and denominator would be the same number, and you'd get 100% efficiency. But um, we're not going to achieve that with one cyclone. <coughs> so that's a, that's a very crude metric to judge a cyclone is the total efficiency. What is more useful is the grade efficiency. And what we do is we calculate the grade efficiency on a per particle size basis. So let's just go back. Um, to this diagram. What that says is, let's focus on the particle size in one category, so one size fraction, and see what happens to it as it goes in, and where does that particle size report in the fines, and where does that report in the course. So in the prior class, I had given you some numbers. We had looked, I'll use a different color here this time, um, 88 kilograms per hour, but of that, we said 17% was um, from a 450, a number 450 Tyler mesh. Uh, 450 Tyler mesh is 32 microns. So 17% in the feed was from that uh, size fraction. In the fine stream, we had that that was 52% from a number 450 Tyler mesh. And by a mass balance, again, 17% of 88 kilograms, 52% of 27 kilograms. By a mass balance, you can calculate that what's leaving here in the underflow is 1.5%. <coughs> so that's a quick, simple calculation. 1.5% from a number 450 Tyler mesh. So in other words, let's take a look at that. 32 microns, that's a very, very small particle size. Your feed coming in contains 17% solids that meet that criteria of 32 microns. Most of that reports out in the overflow. That makes sense. Your very fine dust particles leave out in the fine stream. Very little of your coarse underflow stream is made up of that particle size. So let's go ahead and calculate the grade efficiency, G of X, and that X should always be specified. So I emphasize that by writing G of X on a number 450 Tyler mesh. So X is the number 450 Tyler mesh. Another way of writing that is you could perhaps write G of X equals 32 microns. So just to emphasize that you're dealing with a particular size fraction. And it's again, it's a ratio. It's a ratio of how much of that particle size is in the coarse stream. So the fraction of size x in stream C, the coarse stream, was 0.15, sorry, was 1.5%. MC is the mass flow in the coarse stream. Well, the mass flow in the coarse stream is 61 kilograms per hour. The denominator, M, capital M, is the feed. We have 88 kilograms of feed coming in per hour. And the size fraction for this 32 micron category in the feed was 17%. Okay. So we can calculate G of X really quickly that way. So notice that the numerator is essentially the mass flow of that particle size in the core stream. The denominator is the mass flow of that particle size in the feed. So it's simply telling you the relative masses. 
So in that case, it's 0.92 kilograms per hour in the coarse stream and in the feed, we have 14.96 kilograms per hour. And so that ratio is 6.1%. Now that number is a, is a number, but let's, let's take a look at it and interpret it a bit more. Why do we use the grade efficiency even? Well, the grade efficiency gets taken and we can calculate it for every size fraction. So I'll just illustrate that quickly here. So I can make a plot of size fraction on my horizontal axis and g of x is my vertical axis. So right now, at the 32 micron category, we have a single data point. So let's just put that up here. 32 microns, very small particle size. My g of x is a number between 0 and 100%. So 6.1 on that scale is somewhere over here. So all that work, we just get a single data point. Now I can go to a different size fraction. Let's, let's uh, conceptually take a size fraction, um, let's say 100 micron, just for argument's sake. So in your mind, consider a 100 micron size particle, a particle that's three times bigger than the one we've just dealt with. What would you expect g of x to be for that larger particle? Take a look at the equation, if you need a second or two. So it's a particle that's three times bigger. Would g of x be greater or smaller than that yellow point? Greater? Do you want to take a minute to discuss it with the person next to you if you're not convinced yet? Ask your neighbor to explain it to you. Maybe if you're not convinced yet, consider the case of a particle that's way out here, 1,000 microns. Okay, So a particle of one millimeter. As our particles get bigger and bigger, <coughs> what happens to g of x? goes up. What's the maximum g of x can be? 100% or 1. Okay, so we expect that g of x values to the right will be greater than that yellow point. So that curve, if we fill it out, might look something like that. Okay, and eventually all particles, no matter what their size, Large, our very largest particles will all appear in the core stream. And if, the, and if all of them appear in the core stream, by definition, there's none of them in the fine stream or in the overflow. So that ratio is 1 divided by 1, 100%. So we will recover our grade efficiency, or our recovery, as it were, will be 100%. We'll recover 100% of those particles. Our very largest particles will essentially enter the cyclone spiral down the edge and leave out in the underflow or the coarse stream. Okay, so let's take a look here then, um, just back a sec to the 100 micron particle. By pure coincidence, this 100 micron particle is roughly at 50%. Okay. Is there any significance we can place to the g of x equals 50%? In other words, g of x in this particular cyclone corresponds to 100 micron particles. What does it mean about those 100 micron particles? Okay, it's the particle size where we're just starting to see a 50-50 split. So some of them spiral down and leave in your underflow. Some of them come in, spiral around, go back up again and leave 
in the overflow. So half under, half overflow. Let's just go back to see that a little bit here. Remember these velocity profiles from the prior class. Okay? The one that I'm interested in actually is the vertical velocity because that's the one that tells us if we're going to report out at the top in the overflow or report out in the underflow. And so remember we said that in the vertical direction, we've got a velocity with a positive vector up. So these particles would report to the overflow. Particles with a velocity vector that nets in the downward direction, they end up spiraling out at the bottom in the underflow. So you can conceptually, at least in your mind, consider a particle that's 100 microns, where half of them leave in the underflow, half in the overflow, you can see that those particles would probably lie on the LZVV, the locus of zero vertical velocity. Okay, so half those particles end up going up in the overflow, half of them end up going down in the underflow. So those particles would be spiraling sort of midway um, in, the, in the cyclone. So X50, as this number is called, will that x50. x50 is the particle size that has a g of x equal to 50%. Um, so that's a term that we'll often see in the literature is x50. We'll also see a term cut size referred to that. So cut size or x50, that's the particle size that is split half and half. Okay. So read through those interpretations to make sure they make sense, but we've essentially just covered that part over there. Any questions on that? Yes, Sean. So is that uh, the design standard? Do you design where you want your x to be? Yes, we're going to see that in an example next. Now, the grade efficiency curve, we use them for all sorts of um, purposes. Here I've shown you a grade efficiency curve G of X for a cyclone. But think back to centrifuges. Let's just quickly draw a small diagram of a centrifuge again to remind ourselves. So we have that centrifuge. We have that vertical wall of water. We're spinning on that axis. And in the centrifuge topic, we looked at particles that sort of enter at this radius and they have an arc shape as they land up at that final radius there. Okay, I may have switched R1 and R2 around. Essentially though, that particle travels from the inner wall to the outer edge of the centrifuge that's spinning around. And we said that particles with larger diameters, they all have trajectories that sort of land up over there. Particles with smaller diameters recall have trajectories and they may land up somewhere over there. We can form a G of X curve for a centrifuge as well. Right, so this G of X, a grade efficiency curve, doesn't only apply to cyclones. They apply to any separation device where you've got particles of a size distribution coming in and then a size distribution leaving in one stream versus the other. We can always get G of X curves for those devices. Okay, so, and in fact, that terminology of cut size, you recall, we saw that in centrifuges as well. So a similar, similar concept. Now, what we can look at then are curves of G of X. When you buy a cyclone, you can buy a cyclone by visualizing or seeing its, its uh, grade efficiency curve. Or more commonly, you may provide a sample of feed to a supplier and they can generate a G of X curve for you, given typical flow rates and conditions in your process. All this is very easy to do in the lab yourself. Now, what we want, though, is to understand which G of X curve is better than another. So here's several G of X curves. The first one here is for a, a, a larger diameter, high throughput cyclone. If we go to a smaller diameter, that same cyclone, Notice the G of X curves has shifted. So let's just focus on those first two curves, the very rightmost curve and the one next to it. Which curve do you prefer? G 
you had a t if you could pick two cyclones off the shelf, which one would you pick? Take a minute to think about it, discuss it with someone next to you. You're trying to separate dust. Do you pick the first curve or the second one from the from the right? Any options? Who, anyone would like to pick the first one on the extreme right? Anyone would take the other curve, the one further in, okay? So, explanations. Why the second curve? The period efficiency is higher for small particles just because of the dust. Okay, for dust, for small particles, Let's take 15 microns. You'll get a greater grade efficiency on the second curve. So it's, it's shifted over to the left. So we've got this general sense then that curves that are more to the left too small, towards the smaller particle size would have higher grade efficiency. Okay. If you would, this is uh, maybe something to consider when we talk about grade efficiencies. We've got... Um, I'll just uh, erase this drawing and start it over. We've got a grade efficiency curve that might look like this in orange. And if we have another grade efficiency curve in green, I'm going to try and aim for the same cut size. So there's uh, the cut size is 100 micron. So in green, Okay, how would you characterize the difference in performance between those two cyclones? Qualitatively, not numerically, but just qualitatively, same cut sizes. But what would the green cyclone, I think this is green chalk, yeah. So would be the characteristic of the solids leaving the cyclone with the green curve versus the orange curve. Daniel? Okay, so it's got less, a lower efficiency for particles below the cut size and a higher efficiency for particles above. What does that translate into visually if you had to observe the two streams? Uh, Brandon? And more mass in the underflow, okay? These are ratios though. So it's a ratio of E to mass, so not quite, but. The green curve has a more precise separation point, so if you were doing like solids and you wanted two different streams of a certain size, you could use that to get certain particulates in one stream right. than the other, more, a more specific separation. Okay, so Sean used the term precise that this cyclone here in green would have a, a more precise separation between particles of two sizes. So you'd see a very clear distinction of particles over 100 microns. So particles above 100 microns in size, they would primarily report to your core stream. Particles of 100 microns and below would primarily report to your fines. Okay, so it's got a sharper, we will use this term sharpness. The green curve has a sharper cut. It would be a perfect cyclone that could cut with a step function. Okay, we don't get that ever in practice, but that would be a perfect separation. Um, the green curve is certainly a sharper separation than the orange. The orange curve, you get a bit of everything um, in your course and your fine stream. The green curve, you get a more clearer distinction. That's if you're using your cyclones to split along a particle size. But that's a very different goal to the dust separation goal we had earlier. In the dust separation goal, you want to remove all your solids, no matter of what size, to the core stream. And then your fine stream, your overflow is primarily air or fluid. In this particular example, 
we're using the cyclone for a different purpose, to separate particles into two size categories. Any guesses where we see this in practice? Anyone worked in the mining industry? Okay. Any, if, if for those of you that might go have a career in the mining industry, diamonds, gold, minerals, a typical mining flow sheet has a crushing device. Okay, and that can be of a variety of types, but, but a cone crusher, a ball mill, a, uh, a rod mill. And that mill will then produce a variety of solids with a, diff with a particle size distribution. And a cyclone then, after that, will be used to separate larger solids from the smaller solids. Now the smaller solids, they're crushed enough. You don't need to go recrush them. You can go on and process them. But the larger solids, we capture there and put through the crusher a second time. Okay. So now we're starting to build up our flow sheet. Recycle our coarse stream and bring back those solids, crush them a second time. So the only way for solids to leave in this flow sheet is they enter over here by the crusher and the only other place that they can eventually leave is over there and they'll only leave once they get to the correct particle size. Okay, so we're using our cyclone then as a sophisticated separation device and the recycle tool. Okay, now when we're operating cyclones, we've got um, one real or maybe two factors that we can easily control. The first is the pressure drop, and the second is a parameter I'll talk about over here. But we can adjust that pressure drop by varying the inlet velocity. Now, we know, the, we'll see coming up in the equations, the pressure drop here is defined as the difference between the inlet and the overflow pressure. Okay, So delta P is the pressure you measure there and the pressure you measure over there. That's delta P, is how it's defined. We can't really change the fluids, visco uh, fluids density, so that's not a real way we can actually adjust delta P. But another way we can adjust delta P is by the inlet velocity. And I showed you in one of the earlier slides, let's just quickly go back to that. You can see that here in the entry point of the device, we have a damper. So the angle of that damper, if I open and close it more or less, I get the inlet velocity varying, and I can change my, essentially my pressure drop that way. Now, why would I change my pressure drop? Well, we know that our pressure drop is the factor that increases our efficiency and our recoveries. Okay, so if your cyclone is not giving you the required recovery or efficiency you'd like to see, that's the first thing we can change, is the pressure drop across the cyclone. The next concept that we can change, which will also affect delta P, is the diameter of the underflow. So typically here, that diameter over there often has a part or a piece that we can vary its, its opening size, and that will affect the pressure drop in the system as well, and will affect delta P, and therefore the efficiency. Okay, so inlet velocity and outlet diameter are the two numbers, or two, two adjustable variables. We've seen this all before. Here I'll just quickly recap. A uh, cyclone is very cheap to operate, very cheap to build, small in size and, and very versatile. But some disadvantages we haven't really looked at. They will abrade. So especially if you consider this case of putting rocks and minerals in here. So this is a slurry of rocks and water. That motion on the edges will quickly wear out the cyclone. So it can abrade quite, quite rapidly. Um, if you were treating wastewater that you'd flocculated, there's some high shear forces that you develop inside a cyclone. So you can just break up your solids that way. So not, not entirely suitable for that purpose. Okay. And then here's the really important part that plays into the example we're going to see next. Cyclones should be operated at mostly constant feed rates. What do I mean by that is if we look at our inlet to the cyclone, we come in at some volumetric flow rate Q. And 
this opening here is usually rectangular shape. So there's a rectangular shape which we channel our solids and fluids through, and that rectangular shape opens up into the cyclone. Okay. So that cross-sectional area of that rectangular portion, that's where the damper is, and you can adjust that cross-sectional area effectively with that damper. Okay. But Q is the part that we want to be constant. We don't like to vary that up and down. So if you've got an upstream flow, Q, that's fluctuating in time, the best strategy is the following, is to split that flow rate Q to multiple cyclones. So there's your first cyclone, your second cyclone. So let's say you have a bank of four cyclones and you've got these valves over here. What you would typically do is fine tune the cyclone, it's damper angle, leave it, and then just open or close that valve. So you're either sending nothing to the cyclone or you're sending some volumetric flow rate Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And what you'll do is you'll simply open these valves on demand. So as your flow rate coming in goes higher, open another valve for a cyclone and bring that one online. But we typically don't like to fluctuate that volumetric flow rate through the cyclone. Because once we've set it, we've set those diameters, those damper angles, we like to just keep it that way to operate at the efficiency we need. So we will split our fees. Okay. I'll come back to this slide in a minute. I just wanted to then now talk a little bit about the design issues around cyclones. Okay, so there's many correlations to design a cyclone, but there's two equations that we will refer to. The first one over here is the ratio of pressure forces to inertial forces, also known as the Euler number. So the Euler number essentially multiplied by rho of the fluid V squared equals delta P. It tells us by how much our pressure drop translates into velocity. Okay, so a given cyclone has a fixed Euler number. Once we've determined that Euler number, we, it's a constant. And so this equation then tells us that how changes in delta P translate into changes in the velocity V. Now that V velocity isn't the, this inlet velocity coming into the cyclone. V is a velocity that's internal to the cyclone. And it's given by this equation here. And you'll recognize parts of it. Pi d squared over 4 gives you an idea of the area inside the cyclone. So this portion of the equation is essentially the internal cross-sectional area. Let's just draw that. If we look at the cyclone, d psych refers to that internal diameter. So pi d squared over 4 is the area, q over a is essentially a velocity. It's the internal velocity in the cyclone. Okay, so as I said, it's constant for a given cyclone. We can look it up for a cyclone. If we don't have it, excuse me, we can calculate it quite easily with this equation over there. That gives you an estimate of it. And you can even measure it quite easily. You can feed your cyclone with just a pure air stream, measure delta P, calculate the velocity V from this equation over here. Okay, and then we know rho of our feed, our fluid, and we back calculate Euler. So it's very easy to get the Euler number or calculate it. So that's going to be one of our design equations. There's another design equation and uh, Sean had asked about the cut size. And the cut size is predicted from the Stokes number for a cyclone. Let's take a look at this one. We've seen this equation as well before. You'll see elements of it that are familiar to you. So the Stokes number for a cyclone, or correctly called 
the Stokes 50 is equal to the cut size squared. These are all in metric units, so we need to convert our cut size to meters first, times the density of the solids times the velocity in the cyclone. That's that same velocity we had earlier. Right? So the V over there refers to the um, 4Q over pi d psych. Okay, so that's that velocity over there. And then our denominator, 18 mu f, shows up here again times this diameter of the cyclone. Okay, so we can use this also for, for design purposes. The Stokes number is, is, is fairly constant. And x50 is our desired cut size that we're aiming for. Okay. So what I'm going to put up here is, is a problem related to using these equations. And there's a little bit of a subtlety here. It's a little bit of a guess and check approach. And I'll work through it with you. But here we're looking at designing a cyclone. And we want to know the diameter d psych. So our goal is fairly clear. What diameter of cyclone do we need? We want to treat a Q, a volumetric flow rate Q of 1.77 meters cubed per second. There's all sorts of parameters over there. Now, this problem seems a little bit artificial because we're telling what delta P is going to be, 1650. And that 1650 is given, it's, it's pretty much at the upper limit of pressure drops across typical cyclones. So I had, I think I omitted to mention this earlier in my slide. Um, where did it go? Yeah. So, so cyclones typically have pressure drops of between 500 and 1,500. So we're operating right at that upper bound, just a little bit over it, in fact, for that delta P. So we don't want a delta P any greater than 1,650. And we need to separate particles so that x50 is 0.8. I'm going to give you a minute to work through this. All I want you to do is right now tell me which equation are you going to use to calculate the cyclone diameter. So we've just looked at some equations there. Which of those are you going to use to solve for the cyclone diameter? Ignore this part here, this hint. Just right now look at that problem and figure that portion out. Okay, so I'm asking essentially for your plan here. Which, what strategy are you going to use to calculate the cyclone diameter? Should we use Euler's equation or Stokes equation?
Okay, so use Euler's equation to get the velocity. But we could also get it through there. But that's our goal to solve for. So we, you were going to use Euler's equation to get velocity and then Stokes' equation. Now we know that velocity. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Euler's equation first to get velocity and then uh, Stokes' equation to get d psych. So Euler's equation says um, the Euler number for the cyclone is 700 and then it's delta p So we know delta P, we know rho F, we solve for V, and if you do that, it's 1.98 meters per second. Okay, so that's our internal velocity V. If we use Stokes' equation, then next, the Stokes number for this cyclone is also constant, 6.5 times 10 to the minus 5. So Stokes 50 is constant. And let's rearrange that equation then for D cyclone. Is that what you were heading to? Okay, so I'm going to rearrange that. D cyclone is equal to Stokes 50, sorry, it's x50 squared times rho s times that velocity v 1.98 divided by 18 mu f. Stokes 50. Okay, and if we do that, the D cyclone is 0.15 meters. So 15 centimeters. Just uh, be aware when you're using X50 over here, X50 is your desired X50. So that is 0.8 microns, 0.8 microns is 0 0.8 times 10 to the minus 6. So just be, we work in SI units over there. So a cyclone of 15 centimeters in diameter. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll show you a different alternative next. There's one thing, though, that we should verify is will the cyclone be able to treat that 0.177 meters cubed per second? Okay. We've never verified that, and we can check that now using this equation. We know that we need to operate at a velocity of 1.98, so we know that velocity. We know pi d cyclone we've just calculated. Let's just check that q over there. And if we do that, we solve this equation for Q. Q is equal to pi times d cyclone squared divided by 4 times the velocity V. Okay, so solve this for Q. Oops, I think the V should be in the Q. No, V is in the numerator, yeah. So if we solve that, we get a Q of 0 0.035 meters cubed per second. So we've not able to treat the full flow rate of 0.177. We're treating some sub-portion of it with this smaller cyclone. That cyclone is designed with 15 centimeters diameter with a velocity of 1.98 so that we keep that pressure drop. We have to obey that pressure drop requirement. And this cyclone, we've designed it in such a way to make sure we will have the correct cut size coming from it. So that's the correct cyclone, but it's too it's not sufficient to treat the full flow rate. So we split our feed 
so that each cyclone receives 0 0.035. How many times do we need to split our feed? Well, 0 0.035 goes into 0.177 meters cubed per second five times, 5.0 something. Okay? So the number of cyclones we need, we can perhaps use an equation that looks like this if you want. Um, So we can say Q total divided by N, the number of cyclones, must equal Q. Okay, so in this case, we need five cyclones in order to get our total treatment of that feed stream. The question was earlier, could we use this, the other equation? Well, you can. Um, let me just point out to you how you might go about it. I'll write this other equation back up here again for Q. We had V equals 4Q over pi d cyclone squared. One other approach you could have gone about it is to have specified Q. So you know what Q is, 0.177 meters cubed. We can go into the Euler equation here and solve for V like we did over there on that side. Solve for V, 1.98 meters per second. And once you solve for V, you can bring that V down over here. We know what Q is, and then you solve for D cyclone. That might be one way that you could have approached the problem. Okay, so just repeat that again. So start where we did before. We know delta P, we know rho F. We know our Euler number is fixed. Calculate the internal velocity V, 1.98 meters per second. Bring that down to this other equation we have here that relates the velocity with the volumetric flow rate and the diameter of the cyclone. And if you did that, you would have calculated here D psych is equal to 0.337. So cyclone of 33 centimeters in diameter. So it's a bigger cyclone for sure. But then what you would have discovered, if you take that D cyclone and you sub it into Stokes' equation now, we know cyclone diameter there, we know mu f, we know that velocity v from prior, we know rho s. We know that the Stokes 50 number is constant. Stokes number for a given cyclone is a constant number. If you back calculate x50, what you would have found is x50 is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 6. Or in other words, 1.2 microns. Okay, What is that telling me? What's the interpretation of that result? Yeah, Brandon. Our X50 is, is more coarse than we like. It's 1.2 microns. We're aiming for 0.8. So essentially it says we're not able to achieve the separation we would like with one cyclone. One cyclone of 0.337 meters does not get you the required X50 or the cut size that you need. Okay. So if you were doing this in a guess and check type of way, you could say, well, if one cyclone doesn't do it, well, let me try two cyclones. If you try two cyclones now, we start with the same process again. We know our velocity v. Come to this equation. Now, when we've got two cyclones, q isn't 0.177 anymore. It's half of that because we split the feed half to one cyclone, half to the other. So you'll calculate a slightly smaller diameter. Cal put your smaller diameter into here, and you'll calculate your x50. And you'll see that it still doesn't meet your cut size. And you go to three cyclones, four cyclones, and eventually, when you get to five cyclones, you get the, the cut, di cut diameter you're looking for. Okay. So that's the guess and check approach over here, as I've shown with these arrows through these equations. On this board over here on the right is the single once-through approach to get to the same answer. Okay. Where you calculate the diameter of the cyclone, and then you calculate Q. Okay, so work through that. It's a, that's a st fairly standard way of, of working with cyclones. Uh, what I will do in the next class, the rest of the slides actually in this, in this uh, 
PDF are really just for general interest. So what we'll do is in next class we'll start with the new notes on membrane.